this is what I'd like to talk about today. I, I want to talk about some of these items and go through them pretty quickly and, like I said, create some time for questions or whatever. I'm probably not going to say anything you've never heard before, but I think that if these basics are talked about and handled, it can really set the tone of the band in the right direction for better sound and better success. And so a lot of it is just playing clear time, getting time started in the first place, getting a tune rolling listening for dynamics, listening to and learning song forms, marking phrases, four and eight bar phrases, 16 bar phrases. And if those things can start to happen, the drummer will be much more relaxed, much more confident. And a lot of these ideas are not just drummer ideas, but they can translate to kind of everybody in the band. So I think those things are, are really important. So I'll ask you a question. Have you ever been in, you know, you're directing your jazz band. You've got a new chart. It's going to be great. I'm going to pass this out to everybody, and I'm so excited to play this thing. And you get up there, and you count the first thing off. One, two, uh, two, three, uh. And then the whole thing just kind of folds. The rhythm section sort of implodes on itself a little bit. Saxes don't come in. They're not playing the right rhythms. There's a lot of notes. The trumpets are out of tune, and you're just kind of you're doing that thing where you're waving your hands, and it's kind of not happening. I'm just going to assume that some of you, it's going to be a hard yes. Well, these techniques I'm talking about are going to be able to change that. Yes, a grade school director. Yeah, it happens, you know what I mean? To all of us, for sure. Uh, my first time I played with a big band, I'll tell you briefly, was totally insane. I was went to study at the local community college. I'd taken some percussion lessons, and I went to go play with the jazz band. There you go, crying. Yes, thank you. I, I know. Uh, trust me. Uh, the story is I'm part of that, okay? So... What happened is I went, I went to study at this, there's a great community college here, and I was going to go into U of I, which I eventually did, and study jazz. But I'd never played jazz before, so I called the band director for the jazz band at the community college, and I said, hey, can I come play in your jazz band? And he goes, I, I'm a new percussion student. He said, yeah, that'd be great. You know, have you played any jazz? And at the time, I said, no, I've never played jazz music before. And he said, that's not a problem. He said, how's your reading? And I said, terrible reader. I can barely read anything. Because I was just playing rock and blues and country gigs, you know, and I didn't know. And he's like, well, we're using somebody right now, one of those classic sort of things where they would say that, so they didn't really, he didn't really want to deal with me. Turns out he was a nice guy, and he wasn't really saying that. They actually did have a drummer. So I said, can I show up to the rehearsal? So I go to the rehearsal, and classic, the drummer doesn't show up, you know? So I'm sitting there, and, okay, and he's like, do you want to play? And I was like, well, I, didn't, I don't have sticks. I don't have anything. You know, this is night. You know, no, I don't. And he goes, just try it. And I'm like, okay, fine. So I set the drums up. I'm playing like one of those half brush, half sticks thing and this stick that you'd use to play African drums. And he counts off the first song and I got the music and I don't really know what's going on. And I kind of panic and I start playing like a rock beat. <laughs> and the whole band just folds in on itself and all these people turn around and look at me and it was just total disaster, you know. So eventually I kind of got some jazz time going and... I stayed there and I ended up being in that band. But that first moment was like kind of one of the worst days of my life. You know, it's a complete horrible nightmare. So we're just trying to avoid that. And and when I the reason why I tell that story is because, you know, for someone like Cameron or band director, I know what it's like to be on the other side of that. And these are some of the strategies which have really helped me. So let's blast into that now. Sorry you had to live through that story. But here's the first thing. If I'm going to start a new jazz band chart, I'll tell drummers this, just play time. That's it. Don't worry about fills. Don't worry about anything. Just play time. And if you get lost in the chart, just play time. If you have an advanced drummer, Cameron, if you're an advanced drummer, I suggest that the first time you run down a new chart or you're playing it even the first few times, just play time. And the idea of this is to listen to the rhythm section and get locked with the bass player, get locked with the piano player to play a good time so that the horn section can actually figure out what it is that they're trying to play. And I know that sometimes drummers are excited and they want to play stuff, but what happens a lot is they're looking, they're anticipating figures, they're either dragging or they're rushing. Drummers are either speeder uppers or slower downers. I'm a speeder upper. So the idea of this is they can get their head out of the chart, they can listen to the band. They can listen to the rhythm section, they can focus on playing good time, and that allows the melody to kind of happen. The drummer can be playing clear time. You can kind of figure out what's going on. Now, if that happens, it's really great because the drummer, now they can start to scan for figures. And after doing this, you can begin to add fills and setups. Now, when you've got a drummer, someone like Buddy Rich, for instance, right? 
obviously Buddy Rich played a billion notes, you know, but Buddy Rich, his band didn't even need him to keep time. Pretty much what you have going on there is the band is so good that it doesn't really matter. Now, this comes into a whole band concept, and whenever I work with a band for the first time, if I go and I'm asked to kind of talk to a jazz band, I ask this question. Who is responsible for time in the band? Not a trick question. I'm sure you all probably already know. And obviously the answer is everyone. I'll say, hey, we're all responsible for playing in time. The drummer is not going to be able to keep everybody in time. In fact, a lot of times the bass player sometimes has more control in a jazz band because they're walking the quarter notes. And if you've got the ride cymbal playing ding, ding, a ding, you know, it can be uh, a situation where the horns can sort of just mow right over them. If you have a band that has good time, like, for instance, uh, the Count Basie band, that band swung so hard that Sonny Payne, for instance, could play some amazingly musical fills and setups, but they didn't need him to set up the time. You know, the band swung hard, and he was able to leave space. And there are a lot of those sections, if you hear a lot of those charts, the band's kicking all these figures, and he's not really playing all of them. He's going to really pick his spots. And that's one of the things on drum charts, and we'll come back to this in a little bit, but... Drum charts are, are written very confusing from the get-go because there could be a figure on there telling you what the band's playing, but you don't necessarily have to play it. And there's not necessarily a lot of good information on how any of that stuff is interpreted. And it can be very challenging uh, for a drummer who doesn't really know what's going on with that stuff to be able to kind of figure that stuff out. Some bands have their own time. So, for instance, I'm going to turn this off for one sec. If you have, and I'm going to admit this person. Hey, Jeff. If you have a band that has strong time, say you have a new drummer in the band, but your bass player and your piano player are really good, I'd really encourage them just to listen to the rhythm section and just say, hey, listen. Because what happens is they're not listening. And you know, if they're going through the chart and they're staring at a chart, it's like the ears can turn off and they're not listening to what's going on around everybody. And that ends up sort of being the main problem is that when you're looking at a chart, you're often not listening. So an exercise that I like to do with bands sometimes is something that I do when I'm learning or teaching, rather, how to play a basic beat. So if you have a basic rock beat, you have hi-hat, snare drum, bass drum. You have all three that are going there. And so what I'll do is something that I call the breakdown method. And so what's happening there is I'll say, just play the hi-hat and the snare drum only, or just play the hi-hat and the bass drum only, or just play the bass drum and the snare drum. And then I have them put all that stuff back together and they can really hear. So I'll use this method with an entire band. And I'll say, rhythm section, I want you to not play. And I want the horns to listen. I want the horns to be responsible for time. And I want the rhythm section to listen to how their part would fit in with that. Then I'll do the opposite and I'll have the rhythm section play. And I'll tell the horn players to listen to what's going on in the rhythm. Listen to their time. Listen to the groove that's happening. Now look at your chart. Now look at the notes on your chart. Maybe even sing your part and not actually play it. Then I might do that with other uh, sections of the band. So obviously you'll do that if you're working something out. I want to hear saxes and rhythm or the background figures with rhythm. But if they're really forced to listen to what's happening, they can see how all these things fit together. Now I realize that, one, this may sound like Captain Obvious, and two, there isn't a lot of time for that. Not a, not a lot of time for time which is what happens. It's a 7.15 band rehearsal. You have 45 minutes. I understand that it can be a super challenging thing to do. But even if you just did it once, it would demonstrate what's happening. And I have found that that has translated into other charts, even if you don't necessarily have time to do that all the time. But it breaks everything down to sort of the lowest base of thing, which is all about playing good time. And for me, you know, obviously I'm a drummer and that's important, but they're, you know, for an entire band, if you don't have the whole thing happening time-wise, it's not happening. And I, I'll say this later in the thing, but I had a great band band director who used to always yell at the band. He'd say, ultimately, I don't care what note you play, you have to play it in time. So if the choice was between the right note or out of time, in time, wrong note, every time. So I'd rather have that because if you bog the band down or everything becomes... Uh, nebulous or unclear, then that just sort of continues on that way, and it's uh, super challenging. 
I don't know if anyone's ever seen this monk's gig advice. Anybody ever seen this before? It's kind of a fun thing. Uh, he wrote this handwritten thing. It's been passed around the internet. It's all over the place. And just to finish thing about time on this is he says, just because you're not the drummer doesn't mean you don't have to keep time. And this is the other note th thing that came in. I don't care what note you play. Just make sure that you play it in time, which I really appreciate that quite a bit. I learn so much when I'm teaching, as you know. It's amazing when you just have to talk about the basics all the time that it's, it's so fantastic for me to talk about the fundamentals. I never, I never get bored doing that. You know, it reminds me of that stuff over and over again. And um, what do they say? You don't really know it until you teach it. So that's kind of the basics on getting everything started, trying to get them to listen. There's a couple other things that come up. But so here's the next thing to talk about, which really challenges the drummer and can be a really big deal. The setup of the drum set. OK. Uh, and, you know, you may be looking out in the back of the room. And so the, the drum set's different than other instruments because a trumpet, the valves are basically in the same place. But a drum set, you can have like two toms, like here you can have one tom, you, the cymbals are high or low, they're not really in the same place. So, you know, this is a bit of an exaggeration, but I've seen things almost like this before, you know, and it's kind of a disaster. Now, if, if my drummer is getting ready to play and, and they're having to combat something extreme like this, it's going to be a hard thing to do. I don't know how they're going to swing if they actually do that. In fact, they're not going to extreme angles, it's going to make it really difficult for them to play. So you have another setup like this where things look much better. And, you know, the angles aren't crazy. Everything's reachable. This what's helpful is when you look out to the drum set in the back, it should kind of look like this. And so I want to talk for a second about drum setup and just kind of talk to you about that for one second. So I'm going to switch over to here. You know, I have this st stuff set up to where it's all very reachable from here. And an overhead angle, something that can be really helpful sometimes, is just the idea that I'm setting everything up in a V. And my legs are even going out from V. You can see that the bass drum here is facing forward like that. But I'm actually kind of like this because my body is turned like this. So if I really wanted to be straight, the, the bass drum would need to be a little off a little bit. But, you know, we like things straight, so then I, so we face over here. So making sure that, and also that they're not crowding the plate. Sometimes they get in like this on the kit, you know? And it's like, what do you do when you can't even, how can you lift your leg if it's like that, you know? So just being aware of how they're playing, because they're not going to be able to play if that's kind of what's going on. The other thing is the ride cymbal. So I will have them start with their hand in a V like this, and then turn their hand out to the ride symbol with the thumb on top. And that's basically how I'm doing it. So if you see an angle that looks like this in the back, you know, it's going to be hard for them to get it going on there. If the tom-toms are straight up like this or something, I mean, you just can't, you can't get anything going on. So the drums are the most unusual of all instruments with that because the setup is so varied and so wild. One of the things that I'll say sometimes for people is I'll say, hey, uh, a nice thing to do would be to say, um, I'm going to set these drums up. Now, if, if you have to tear them down for every rehearsal, I totally understand that. But if you can, you know, you can use some of these things to set up, look back there, and then you set it up and you say, I set it up, don't touch it. You know what I mean? One of those things. And if you can't do that, you know, I understand. So it is what it is. But if you scan out and there's some problems, the, the ergonomics of where they are are going to have a tremendous effect on what it is that they're able to play. And it, it can be challenging. I'll tell drummers, it's, oh, they're going off to their first uh, jazz festival. And I say, you know, I want just do the best you can. Remember to have fun. Don't worry about it. Because as drummers, because the kits are weird, here's something that might actually happen. If the horn players got their horns, they walk out and they sit down and they get their music out. But you're the drummer. And say you're sharing a kit for this thing. And you walk up, and the drummer before you played left-handed. So you have to flip the whole kit around backwards. And then you've managed to get that stuff into place the way you want to. And you look up, and the band director is getting ready to count off the first tune. And you're holding brushes, but you need sticks. So you put the brushes down, and you pick up the sticks, and you turn to look at your very first chart, just as the song's being counted off, and the music falls on the floor. 
and that's going to happen because it's happened to me. And I'm not saying that to create a disaster nightmare scenario in these children's lives, but I want them to know that these, this is what happens in the drum universe all the time. So they'll go to their first festival and they'll come back and what they'll say, they'll say, uh, I had brushes, I needed sticks. I said, yeah. They're like, the high, the ride symbol was up here. And I couldn't get the thing untied to, uh, you know, loosen the wing nut to get the symbol down. I'm like, yeah, yeah, it's a drag, isn't it? They're like, yeah. I said, yeah. And you just got to do it anyway. Did you play anyway? Was it okay? And they said, yeah. And they'll say that, or they'll say the music fell on the floor or whatever. And I said, did you play? And was it fine anyway? And they say, yeah. But these are sort of unusual circumstances that don't happen that much with other instruments, and it can be kind of a crazy thing. All right, so we're going to move on. So this, here's an area that I bet, I bet Jeff has an opinion on this. Here we go. Playing jazz time. And I'll say this. Uh, here's the deal. You ready? To play the bass drum or not to play the bass drum? Either way is okay. I don't have a dog in that fight. I will say a couple things about it, though. And that is this. If you don't want them to play the bass drum, I completely understand that because it can be out of control if they haven't learned to control that. But I have seen band directors say to the drummers, don't play the bass drum and don't put your foot on the bass drum pedal. And I would only ask that you allow them to put the foot on the pedal even if you don't want them to play it. Because I realize that this is what happens when they go to play jazz time. It has to do with style dynamics, but let me know if you've heard this scenario before. So we're gonna go to here and I'm gonna turn this off. So, so they're gonna play jazz time and I'm gonna uh, turn off this mic because it'll, it'll block. So, and here's how they play jazz time. And you're thinking, please help me. No. And so you say, play quieter. The bass yeah, drum, just everything's got to be quieter. So they do this. So the issue is that they cannot connect the ride symbol from the bass drum. Now, there are a few things that you can do to do that. But the first thing is just to say that your symbol and your bass drum can disconnect from each other. And often, sometimes, just by saying that, they can begin the process of trying to disconnect that. As drummers, they want to do everything this side. They want to do everything this side. And that can be a super challenging thing to do. It takes some practice, but I'll give you uh, a little trick on it. And I think of the drums as a mixing console. So for instance, and even a jazz band for that matter, I know that you'll know what I'm talking about. But for, for rock or blues, you know, anything heavier stuff, it, you're built from the bottom up. And for the jazz stuff, it's the top, kind of the top down. So I'm constantly monitoring. So I've got four limbs, and that's what I'm dealing with. Rock, cymbal, bass oh. drum, snare drum, hi-hat, right? So if you're trying to, you know, deal with that, you know, you might be thinking of it that way. And that, sometimes that's a nice way to explain it just so that they have some idea of what's going on, you know. Uh, you're trying to get that to be quieter. So here's a method for playing time. Now, normally, if you're feathering the bass drum, well, one, I don't want them to do this. So let them play the bass drum. Often I've seen their leg back here. And then if you actually have to hit the cymbal, you want them to be able to play the bass drum with it and they have to pull some crazy move like that, or they simply don't hit it. One of my pet peeves is hitting a cymbal, <clears throat> especially on a downbeat, and not having a bass drum underneath it, you know? One of those classic sort of... And I think, please, just no matter what happens, hit the bass drum at the end. So having it there, even if they could just play boom, boom, right? Okay, so here's the trick. If you're playing time, you're turning your ankle like this, I'm turning my ankle. Usually they're playing heel down. So if you're going to play heel down, they're going to play basic jazz time like this if they're feathering the bass drum. I may play a teeny bit louder because without the overhead mic on, it's hard to hear. But if you, this is basically what you got going on. And this is me thinking about turning my ankle. You can do that. Now, 
The Jedi mind trick is to not think about your ankle, and this will help the volume come down. I did it with a student today, an hour before I got on this call. I say, think about your knee, which is a weird thing. But here's the deal. If you're pushing down on your knee into the heel, it's going to move the foot forward, and you're going to play the pedal. And if you're not thinking about turning from your whole ankle or your whole leg, the volume difference is very significant. So I'll leave this mic on, but I'll just play the bass room quietly so you can see it. So here's the ankle, and then here's me thinking about my knee. So when I play time, you got this going on. Come back, let me play just quietly on the ride. Hopefully it won't be too terrible, but here we go. I'm going to play this so you can see it. One, two, three, four. Knee, knee, pushing down, 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 down. That in itself can make a huge difference in the playing. I would say that that's probably a good thing to try with your drummers if you want to try to get them to play the bass drum and do it. And like I said, it takes a little bit of time, but it's also something that, um, how do I put this? Maybe you could, if you're running basic blues scales or something like that as an intro, this would be a time they could try it, you know, and start to get a feel for that and introduce that as a technique. So starting the bands, playing time. Anybody had this happen? Failure to launch. Issues getting rolling. So one, two, three, four, boom. First thing that happens is that the drummer starts to beat backwards. They play the hi-hat on the downbeat. The rhythm section begins to implode on itself. And you are mission control trying to figure out how to untangle everything that is happening. How do I turn these people around? <clears throat> the drummer's playing backwards. The horns came in. We are a quarter note off right now, and it is a total disaster. Boy, I tell you. Well, there's an easy fix for that. And it's called the three beat rule. And it's about starting jazz time. And so here's the quick fix for that. If they do it, you'll never have to worry about that ever again. So here's how it goes. <clears throat> So that's it. They're going to play a quarter note, then they're going to play the two notes, then they're going to play one, two, or three, and then they're going to have full time going. So for me, it's always been about the first three beats, and that happens if, if I'm starting a groove or if I'm changing to another groove. I had a student last week. We worked on this. They turned it around. The second week they came back, they don't. he came in and just, bam, started playing jazz time. Not a big deal. Sometimes the trick on this can be if you're not playing the bass drum as part of their time, they want to play something. So they're going to do this. One, two, three, four. They want to play a foot, you know, with that cymbal. So if they don't have the bass drum to play with it, then, then it can be a problem. But here's how it goes. So I'll just play lightly so I can just use this talkback mic. So I just have them play beat one with the symbol bass drum. Here we go. Two, three, four, one. These two together. And I'll have them do it a few times. One. Do it again. One. Do it again. One. Then beat two. All comes together. One, two. Hi-hat, bass drum, ride symbol. Beat two. One, two. Just those two notes. I have them do it a few times. One, two. Then they get to beat three, and this can be weird because they're going to want to play time like this. And you've probably heard a jazz band drummer do this before. Let me know if you have. One, two, three, four, five. They cannot separate uh, and play on the downbeat because their body's trying to get them to play that first note. So I have them do this. Play two ride cymbal hits. That's a three. A three. Do it a few times. A three. One more. A three. Last one, I'll play Play the bass drum note on the second note. One, two. One, two. Do it again. One, two. Again. One, two. Put it all together. One, two, three, four. One, two, a three. Do that a few more times. One, two, a three. 
You get the idea. But if they do that a few times, they won't have to do it again. There's a video of this on the website. There's a video of a bunch of other stuff related. Style dynamics, that's on there also. It deals with a lot of that stuff. All those things are on there. So that's going to fix it, and you're never really going to have a problem with that ever again, really. The next thing I want to get into, uh, we talked a little bit about this before, but we'll talk about it again briefly, and that is the dynamics. And it's about you know listening, having them being able to listen. And you know, for the drummer, does this start strong or does it start light? How does it end? You know, getting out of the chart, paying attention to that. Has anyone ever seen the Lincoln Center Jazz Orchestra? Seen him, Jeff? Yeah. Unbelievable. So, weird thing. I saw them last week. And the first time I put together this PowerPoint and gave this talk was a couple years ago. And I saw them the night before I did it, and I put this thing in here. And it was like they had dynamics within dynamics. Within each section, you go back to the idea of a mixing console. There was such control and balance over each little thing. It was just unbelievable. So another thing I'll have, you know, bands do if you're working on a chart is I just have them, you know, listen to the Count Basie band. You know what I mean? Like, listen to how they're doing that. And hopefully they can connect with it, you know. And a lot of times in my lessons, I'll do that. I'll say like, well, I have to, or make them, assign them to listen to that stuff. And I'll go listen to Count Basie, Frank Sinatra at the Sands. Go listen to that record, you know, and find, tell me about one song and something on there that's interesting, you know, because they're able to exaggerate these things. So when I talk to drummers about this stuff, it's like exaggerate the dynamics. The louds have to be super quiet and the louds and can be really loud. Uh, the same big band director that said this to me, if you can't hear everything, you're playing too loud. Also had me do something totally crazy style. We were, it was when I was doing music school here at the university and we were playing a concert at Craner and he had this sort of, he was a pretty out there kind of 70s psychedelic kind of dude, but an amazing arranger. He was one of the first graduates from the North Texas State Jazz Program. There was a bunch of guys that ended up here that had gone down there. In any event, uh, he wrote this piece and it was really just a, like a drone kind of thing that went on for a long time. I'm playing mallets on the toms. And I said, well, how do I know how loud I'm supposed to play? He goes, well, I'll just keep doing this, waving you on. And when I do this, that means you're at the volume I need you to be at. And this is a, just a demonstration of exaggerated dynamics. And I'm playing very quietly. Boom, 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 snares off, you know, mallets on the toms kind of thing. And by the end, it go, 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 crash. Da, 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 da. And, I, and he was smiling at me doing this the whole time. I mean, I don't know if anybody else could hear anything. I mean, we're playing in one of the halls here, which are not built for someone like wailing on drums like I was, but I was just kind of doing what he did. And we got to the end of it and I said, you know, what was going on with the volume? He never told me to stop. He goes, man, it sounded great. <laughs> so he was just like, he was just one of these kind of guys, you know, but that's kind of what I was talking about before of the extremes between all these different kinds of things. All right, I'm gonna jump ahead because there's some here real quick I want to get into. So here's something that's really important, and this stuff can go fast. And that is not getting lost in the chart. And it's really hard, um, I think, sometimes for drummers because I don't know if you guys know this or not, but historically, drummers aren't good readers. That's probably news to all of you. <laughs> There's also a lot of stuff that's confusing. There's slash marks on there. There's all kinds of stuff that doesn't make a lot of sense. And you can get lost in repeat signs. It, and, and the drum chair is a lonely place. Um, you know, if you've got four trumpets and you're getting ready to play figures, like someone else is picking up their horn, like, oh, I guess we got to play right now. We got to do it. But if you're the drummer and the band's going to stop and you don't know where you are, I mean, it's tough, man. Uh, and trust me, I've, I've been in very uncomfortable situations where I got lost and it was a real problem, you know? Um, so here's some of the stuff again about getting out of the chart and not having to stare at every little thing, marking the form. 
marking four and eight bar phrases, marking entrances when trombones or someone comes in to mark places, and then visual cues. Like I said, people are picking up a trumpet. Something's getting ready to happen. Be aware of that. So get them to listen to the song form, you know? Is it a 12 bar blues? Is it an AABA form? Uh, is it a 16 bar Latin? What is it, you know? And all these things are gonna allow them to be able to navigate their way through the tune. They're gonna be able to understand a form, learn a melody, know where the top of the form is, know where the bridge is. I didn't realize when I first started playing big band that all these things were based around, you know, uh, regular song form. It's just an expanded blues with all these parts. And then there's orchestrations and soli sections and then solos, and then they play a lead out. You know, it, I, I was kind of confused by that initially. Oh, it's just AAPA. It's just repeating 16 bar form that's happening, you know? So the first thing I'll do is I'll mark on the chart for people. I'll say, hey, here's the form. It's AAPA, 12, 12, 16, 16. And as you can see, I'm marking on there, four bars, eight bars, 12 bars. And that's kind of what's going on. I'll also try to mark phrases, four bars, eight bars, 12 bars. And then you can see down at the bottom, I'll write in bridge. And I'll do that all the way through the song. I saw a guy that had done that one time and I've done that every time since. So I always know where I am. So if I know a form and I don't know where I'm at, but I know that a bridge is coming up, bam. Oh yeah, trombones, I wrote that down. Trombones come in at the second bridge. So there's a bunch of solo sections, but I don't have to pay attention to that. I get my head out of the chart. I can listen and be engaged in the music. Another thing that happens sometimes for drummers is confusing markings. And can anyone look at this and just um, identify what might be confusing to a drummer? It's kind of quiet. You got there, so I'll just kind of jump ahead. But here's the story. So you got a four bar phrase on top. And then in the second sort of system here, they got the four here, which is cool because this is like a six bar phrase. But all of a sudden you got four bars, you got six bars, you got six bars, and it's a 16 bar chunk of time, and it's kind of confusing because this four is actually the eighth bar of the phrase. And as a drummer, I'm thinking of phrases, not other stuff. So I would probably do this. I would change and put the four up here, and then I would put the eight there and 12 and 16, and then there I have it. So if you have a drummer that's missing an entrance or something, you might look at the phrasing of the chart because they may not be able to count very well or get confused in all the repeat signs. Because look at all those repeat signs. And these are six bar phrases. Like, like it's not even four bars there. You know what I mean? Like ultimately you should just be able to deal with that. But sometimes that's what's happening. So I'll just mark it so I can know exactly where I am and sort of what's going on with that stuff. And it really helps me figure that stuff a lot. So the other thing about this is the way phrases are marked. So for instance here, so this is a, uh, Part of the bridge on Bolivia, or if they have a 16-bar bridge on that, which you would think is eight plus eight. Does anyone know the song Bolivia? Da, 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 ba, 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 da. You know, Jeff. Anyway, sometimes you think that's eight plus eight, but as a drummer, in terms of marking phrases, this is just a aside for that. Is I'll I'll mark that instead of eight plus eight. I really think of that bridge section as four plus eight plus four, because. You're coming into that bridge, that land, the bass player's playing. This is me playing bass. Doom, do, do, ba, do, 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 boo, ba, ba, but here we go. Da, 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 ba, ba, da, da. There's four. Then, da, 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 two, da, 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 two, three, last four. Ba, ba, da, ba, da, ba, da, ba, da, ba, 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 da, ba, doom, boom, doom, doom, da, doom, doom, doom. I apologize. You guys had to just hear me sing that. But. I wanted to demonstrate that point that that's a weird phrasing, four plus eight plus four. So, but if I'm playing that tune, that's how I'm thinking about it. So that when I respond to the people around me, I know where I am and kind of what's going on for that. Those kinds of phrasings can make a tremendous difference in a drum. And we haven't even gotten to figures and we're not even really going to do that. It's like all this stuff like listening, dynamics, just playing time, you know, making sure I know where I am in the chart, having a way to navigate that, understanding the form. That's going to make it easy to add all the other stuff. I mean, that's a not a it's it, it's not it's a no brainer at that point. So because they already understand the song and how they're supposed to be listening and the dynamics and all that stuff. And that is the shape of everything. And all the other stuff is just, you know, that's just the that's just, you know, cake decoration at that point, you know, but this is getting the cake together. And again, like I said, I it, this seems oversimplified. 
and you're like, I can't believe you're telling me all this. I know all this. Uh, I apologize, but you know, for a drummer that may be listening or just to go, oh, wow, maybe it is that simple. And in some cases it is. These basics can change everything like in an instant. They really can. Here are a few clearly written phrases. Almost done on this. You know, you got four, you got four, you got four. And then even when you get down into 17, it's an eight bar phrase. They did a really nice thing. Four, six, eight. And then you have this other chunk at the bottom, which is four bars, and then really easy to see another four bar phrase. If they can navigate all this stuff, if they can, you know, figure out the four, it's huge. The other thing is just visual cues. You know, writing in, tr trombones are getting ready to play. And so you can say, hey, they're gonna, trombones are gonna play on the last bridge of the last solo. So just know that and then move on. Until then, don't look at your chart. You know, play with the band. Play with the soloist. Listen to what the bass player is doing. You know, be in the band. Stop staring at your music. When you see them pick up the trombones, look at the bridge and keep playing. That's all the information that you need to know. And if they can navigate some of that stuff, it's kind of smooth sailing. You know, it really is. And, and you know, one of the quotes that I have, this is something from my book, and I tell it to drummers all the time. When you're the drummer in the band and no one looking at you, that means everything is going well. People look at the drummer when everything's not going well. So I have students and they'll come in and I'll say to a student, the parents will be there and I'll say, uh, hey, how'd jazz band go today? And they're like, uh, I say, did anybody look at you today? And they say, no. And I said, what does that mean? They said, it means everything went well. And I said, that is exactly what that means. If no one's looking at you, that means everything. Because in order to look at a drummer, like 18 people have to really make an effort and turn around. And then all of a sudden you got 18 people turning around and you know, occasionally they, you're not turning around that often when there's a hot lick or something going on there. Who is it? Cameron. If you're still here, Cameron. You know what it's like when 18 people turn around and look at you, don't you? <laughs> or when your band director stands, uh, scans over the top of that music stand and gives you that death stare. <laughs> I do. Miss you do. That's what we're trying to avoid, man. That's what we're trying to avoid here. I had some other stuff on here, and so that was the other part. This is the last thing I'll put up for these things because I was just such a my band director said this to me all the time stop looking at that chart and play the drums that's what he used to say to me all the time he's a great man he really taught me a lot I was I've been so fortunate to have uh, good teachers there's a reason why we became band directors and teachers it's because we had good teachers you know and we you know it was a haven for us to, you know to go into the band room and hang out and play music and do all that kind of stuff and there was a reason why those things appealed to us, and now we get to do that for others. So when I, when I get to pass on information that was given to me with students that I have, you know, I always feel like uh, it's an honor to be able to do that. So the fact that you would spend some time here, you know, discussing some of this stuff with me is uh, mm -hmm. I just really appreciate your time. I'll sign off until next time. You guys take care. Thanks so much.